I'd like to hand over now to Councillor Tom Milliken from the City of Banyul and MTF Cycling Ambassador, Deputy Chair. Go ahead. Hi, Tom. Thanks, Jonathan. Great to be here. Um, very exciting time for being in Melbourne, coming out of lockdown. Can't wait. So um, my job today is to introduce Ian. Ian Laurie is currently working on a PhD in urban planning. Oh, looks like we might have lost Tom. Okay. Um... Don't worry, I, I could continue the introduction perhaps while, while Tom logs back in. Thank you. Um, so Ian's PhD is concerned with mobility as a service, autonomous vehicle technologies and legacy public transport networks. Ian holds an MPhil in infrastructure engineering and undergraduate qualifications in urban planning and geography. His MPhil research contrasted the effectiveness of buses as feeders to rail lines in Melbourne and Montreal. He lectures in public transport network planning in the University of Melbourne's Melbourne School of Design. His transport research builds on over 20 years of experience in the communications and renewable energy sectors, for several years chairing the Clean Energy Council's wind industry national lobbying efforts. And with colleagues at the University of Melbourne, Ian is currently finalising a report on the barriers to transition of Melbourne's urban bus fleet to electric propulsion. He is pleased to share some of these findings with you today. But before I hand over to Ian, I'll, I'll hand back to Tom, who dropped off momentarily, but lovely to see you back. I didn't really drop off, but I know I'll show up here. No, thanks, Jonathan. Very good job. I was going to struggle with a few of those words, but it's fantastic <laughs> to have Ian here. Um, we've spoken to him before, and he's an incredible, smart man, and um, very honoured to have someone of his intellect addressing us today. So welcome, Ian, and thanks very much. Uh, thanks, Tom. Thanks, Jonathan and, and Jane. And uh, great uh, to have the opportunity to to talk to the to the webinar uh, today. So I'm just going to try and share my screen and just make sure it's all going to work. Okay, hopefully you're seeing a nice big yellow Norwegian electric bus there. Is that right? Looks marvellous, yes. Yeah, terrific. Okay, so I was going to talk to you today about some research that we've been completing uh, here at the University of Melbourne, um, investigating uh, the challenges, but also the opportunities of transitioning uh, Melbourne's bus fleet to, to zero emissions. Um, our work uh, has been informed by uh, a range of workshops that we've taken um, over the course of this year with a whole range of um, key players from contracting, uh, consulting, from operations, uh, from bus suppliers uh, through the Melbourne network. So it's um, fairly uh, significantly industry um, informed. So as we've just heard from uh, Naomi, which was a terrific uh, and interesting, it's really good to sort of uh, follow up on, on Naomi's presentation with the material I've got here today. So as Naomi was mentioning, um, the Victorian government is has made an announcement that we will be procuring only uh, zero emissions buses from 2025. So um, I guess it's probably just important to kind of think about what that really means. It's quite different from saying that all buses will be electric uh, by 2025, and it is a little bit uh, nuanced uh, compared to the objectives that are happening up for transport for New South Wales, which is basically saying that, that all of their buses will be zero emissions by 2030. So if you think about a typical urban bus having a, a 10 plus year operational life, it may well be many more years before the full transition occurs in Victoria. But I guess that's a little bit semantics, but nevertheless, a transition is about to commence uh, in Victoria. And our research has really been looking at kind of some of the details and intricacies that, that sit behind that. So first of all, well, why is electrifying our bus fleet like important? Why is transitioning our buses to electric propulsion a priority when, you know, in particular, we're so far behind uh, many parts of the world in electrifying our private vehicle fleet? Um, why is electrifying the buses uh, such an important uh, requirement? Well, well, why is it? Well, I guess it's, and Naomi alluded to this as well, is primarily emissions from the transport sector are growing both proportionately and uh, overall immediately prior to, to the pandemic. Um, so although electricity uh, still individually contributes uh, the most as an overall sector, um, the economics of a transition to renewable energy uh, are now 
compelling. Uh, so our fossil fuel generation assets, they're all ageing. Uh, renewables with storage uh, are now the cheapest form of new build energy to replace them. So if I simplify the challenges greatly, uh, the emissions reduction challenge across the electricity sector is kind of on, on track to be solved. But for transport, that's not yet remotely the case. Um, transport, as Naomi mentioned, contributes uh, nationally in, in, Australia, in, in Victoria at least around 20% of total emissions. And as the electricity sector shifts to renewables, transport is proportionally and overall going to keep growing as our population grows. So we've got a challenge in the transport sector. And if we look at how we uh, get around, um, with such a high mode share to private vehicles, you can see across the bottom of the bar chart here, um, the carbon emissions of replacing that car fleet from fossil to electric vehicles are really quite substantial, um, even with renewable energy that will perform an increasing portion of actually how they might get charged towards the later years. But there's still a lot of uh, embedded emissions involved in actually just replacing uh, that total number of vehicles on our fleet. But critically, if, if all we did was replace fossil fuel-driven cars with electric cars, in, in many ways that perpetuates a lot, lot of the existing burdens that we have of, of transport and car dependence uh, in, in urban Melbourne. So issues such as uh, urban sprawl, inequitable access to opportunity for those who, who can't access cars, the old, uh, the young, the disabled, uh, and it also doesn't help solve the financial burden of, of in many parts of the city, um, the burden of having to own multiple cars per household just to go about your day-to-day -day needs. And significantly as well, a, a shift of the private vehicle fleet to electric vehicles also fails to address a whole range of, of, of health impacts um, that, that uh, are not related to the tailpipe emissions, but actually just come from the physical inactivity uh, to air pollution that, that comes from the other uh, um, uh, emissions that will come from vehicles from tyres, et cetera, et cetera. So these are not, of course, arguments um, not to encourage a shift of EVs in the, in, the, in the private vehicle fleet. It's just more to consider there's actually quite a lot more to this problem than, than simply just shifting all the uh, current uh, cars to EVs and then the problem solved. It's, it's not. So from a public transport perspective, Melbourne's kind of fortunate in the in the emissions change that uh, much of our public transport is already sort of pretty much well on the way. We've got electric trains and we've got uh, a great endowment of electric trams and both those are, uh, are able to be powered by renewable energy. But our buses are still overwhelmingly remainingly powered uh, by diesel. So there is an imperative to electrify the bus fleet. And for that to have an overall emissions uh, benefit, the electricity that the, the buses uh, run on needs to be sourced from renewable power. And so fortunately, that's no longer too much of a challenge, uh, technically, or economics uh, in the coming years. So what's involved? Well, first of all, we'll have a, a bit of a look at an, an overview of the Melbourne bus network alone. Um, it, it's highly fragmented. Uh, there's multiple separate franchised operations uh, in Melbourne, there's over 355 routes, and, and as Naomi was mentioning earlier, if you take it as a, as a statewide, it's much more than that. Uh, we have well over 2,000 buses uh, on the road each day to, to, to serve just Melbourne's needs with, with a whole many, many hundreds more across the broader state. And in Melbourne, we've got 34 different bus depots uh, where they're all stored. Yet, despite that sort of the size of that network, um, the buses handle just 3.4% of the journey to work challenge uh, back at the 2016 census. So, you know, the system is highly fragmented, but it is somewhat underachieving. So what's needed to transition to electric buses uh, in Melbourne? Well, what we need, as Naomi has alluded to, uh, a, a clear plan to transition our bus assets from kind of a, a operating ecosystem of fossil fuel-driven vehicles to... Uh, one which is a zero emissions bus one. And it certainly looks like, certainly for urban buses, it looks like uh, battery electric buses are kind of winning out that technology cost race. Uh, and hydrogen, whilst maturing pretty quickly, it may well form uh, a portion of our kind of longer distance uh, trucking and our longer distance um, uh, highway bus network. Uh, it certainly looks like battery electric is the urban bus of the future. 
So this change will require well, new buses, of course, but also if you think it through, uh, it's actually new charging infrastructure, certainly in depots, but possibly on routes as well. It's going to require new training and skills, which will replace uh, many skills in, in diesel mechanics. And there's some crossover skills in maintaining an electric bus, but, but actually relatively few. So there's going to be many new skills required, but some will become redundant. Uh, we need uh, a clear procurement program of how these new electric buses will replace the diesel buses in each depot. Do you go depot by depot or do you sort of scatter them everywhere and gradually move them through? We need an idea of how to do that. We need a complete rethink in particular about how we tender and contract out our buses. So currently contracts are almost uh, exclusively uh, structured based on fairly modest margins around the diesel bus operating environments. And so uh, the, the current contract uh, payment models are based on this sort of premise of, well, as the older buses in that fleet um, it, uh, are retired through the course of the contract, uh, then the payment structures uh, are very carefully manipulated to, to, to adjust those payments when a new diesel bus comes in. So it's structured on an old diesel bus out and a new diesel bus in. Um, uh, that doesn't really suit when actually the new bus becomes an electric bus. The cost profile... Uh, of electric buses are quite different. Actually, not necessarily, and certainly so as, as the years progress, uh, but not necessarily actually more expensive uh, in the total life cycle cost of those uh, vehicles, but certainly different over the contract life period. So the current contract structures are not really well suited. So the transition in turn actually presents some really quite specific difficulties. Um, so... If you were to install charging infrastructure in the depots around, uh, around Melbourne, um, that takes up space. And many of our depots are actually really quite congested. They're actually full of buses as, as bus services, particularly into new growth areas are expanding. Uh, existing bus depots are, are actually quite full up. So actually putting new charging infrastructure in there could actually reduce, um, uh, it might actually be only fewer, fewer buses able to fit into the depot. And so, therefore, it might need a trigger for a, a new or expanded depot, not, neither of which are kind of impossible barriers to overcome, but they're ones which are actually uh, not quick to do. Um, there's pretty thin margins on bus franchises, meaning that, that any new infrastructure of charging infrastructure and the buses themselves is likely to be uh, requiring some pretty significant um, public sector involvement. So it's encouraging to hear that, that the Naomi's group are pretty well aware of this stuff. Um, you know, we can't assume that the private sector is actually just going to, to come and provide all of this, or if they do, whether it's actually going to be able to be provided in what will be the most cost-effective uh, form. Um, a few of the depots, a few of those 34 depots are state-owned, uh, but the vast majority are actually privately owned. And so that really complicates any future intent that, uh, that Yale was referring to, to actually competitively tender uh, out the routes um, further down the track. Uh, so if you've installed at quite significant state investment cost, uh, some uh, new charging infrastructure, which might last 20, 30, 40 years, um, uh, it's going to be pretty difficult to actually have an open level playing field competitively tendered process when that infrastructure has been installed in a, a freehold um, privately owned um, bus depot. So the current contracts also provide no incentives for the private operators um, under their current contract period to replace their fleet with electric buses. It's going to come from and be paid for some way or another by government. And it would seem pretty logical that the statewide purchasing power uh, for 2,000 plus new buses, plus all of the new ones out into regional Victoria, uh, based on some uniform standards of better access, uh, is going to produce better outcomes than leaving it to the many small operators to, to, to individually purchase their own buses. Um, and it was encouraging, in a sense, to hear from Naomi to suggest that there actually isn't a, um, uh, an opposition to that type of state procurement um, uh, at the moment. It's certainly something which is being looked at. But in solving all these technical and contracting issues, we might actually end up forgetting what a zero emissions bus transition kind of really needs to be all about, which is actually about reducing emissions. And in a sense, the best way to actually reduce emissions is to get more people on buses. And so it's not really about having, uh, so it's about having actually a more useful bus network in the first place, kind of regardless of what the buses are propelled by. 
because uh, an empty bus ultimately isn't much use, not, not actually for any purpose of what a bus is actually for, but even uh, certainly an empty bus is not very good for reducing emissions. And it's pretty clear that our current network uh, is underperforming. Um, and that's, I guess, why uh, the, the government is actually looking at the Victorian bus plan, which is, which is pretty good. But merely changing to electric buses based on the existing network isn't going to overcome the many problems in the current network. So if we look at the 2016 uh, census, Melbourne's buses handled 3.4% of the journey to work. And looking at uh, the VISTA data immediately prior to the pandemic from 2018 figures, uh, a mere 2% of overall weekday trips uh, were taken uh, by bus, uh, a figure which is kind of comparable to, to the number of trips across Melbourne taken by bicycles. And I guess like bicycles, uh, buses both can and need to do more in our transport mix. So one of the questions is really, what can we do to genuinely lift uh, ridership on our buses what changes can we make to kind of shift our, our buses to make them competitive over uh, the travel times where the vast majority of trips are actually being taken? So again, looking at the most uh, recent VISTA data, the vast majority of trips uh, across uh, Melbourne are taken uh, relatively short distance and they're relatively short duration and disproportionately they're taken by car. So the orange uh, bars here are actually what public transport is, of which a small component of that is, in turn is, is actually bus. So what can we do to make buses, diesel, electric or otherwise compete in this sub 30 minute um, travel time? That's, that's where the money is, that's where the market is and what can we do to get our bus network to compete better in that, at that shorter distance uh, trip demand? So what's needed? Well, basically, at a head, headline level, it's fast, frequent and direct services. Um, we need to explicitly align the electric bus transition with a network reform ambition to restructure the network towards that fast, frequent and direct. The evidence base for, for network benefits of, of fast, frequent and direct services is actually really well established now in the academic literature. And uh, hearing Naomi uh, this morning, it's, it's really good that fortunately Introducing a sort of network of that type uh, is, is not really swimming against the political rhetoric. Uh, we're not uh, going to be campaigning for something which is actually uh, against what government is actually thinking about doing. And as Naomi has outlined, more frequent, direct, faster services are absolutely part of uh, Victoria's uh, bus plan. Uh, they're also forming um, uh, part of both the uh, recommendations of both published uh, reports from Infrastructure Victoria's five-year plans as well. A key date in all of this is 2025. Many of our bus contracts come up for renewal at that time, and that's a really key opportunity to renew those contracts based on both the revised economics that are inherent in electric propulsion and the requirements that might be needed in, in, in depot renewals, but also it's a great opportunity to actually restructure the routes at that time uh, into a revised network structure that could be dominated by fast, frequent and direct services. And I think it's really important that now kind of, you know, with sort of four years or so um, uh, prior to that point, it's the time now to start building the political consensus behind such reforms, which, you know, at, at, at the detail level could be quite political contentious, politically contentious. And that's something that obviously... Uh, you know very, very well. Um, more frequent services are absolutely critical. We're not going to get material uh, shifts uh, of, of mode to, to bus uh, unless we have really citywide turn up and go frequencies. So we've got to ensure that buses can operate more frequently, more directly and in a manner that's isolated from traffic. And it's encouraging also to hear that Naomi's um, team is very, very much cognizant of these issues and the recruiting um, um, the, the otherwise um, fairly dull engineering work of um, signal engineers to actually achieve that. So that's pretty good. If we do this, depot usage can be optimised. Um, you've got more buses uh, being able to be moving through the suburbs quicker so you can actually have a better level of service with actually a comparable or even less uh, uh, scale of your fleet. But critically, doing it, the network can overcome that challenge of, of sort of the current suburban travel demand of, of sort of anywhere to anywhere um, and particularly so as the CBD relatively speaking is actually uh, potentially going to be suffering you know a few more years of um, 
uh, of relative, uh, if not if not actual total decline relative to actual transport that's occurring within the suburbs. In doing so, we can get high bus occupancies and reduce emissions, improve mobility, accessibility and opportunity for, for car-free or, or reduced car lifestyles. So just quickly, um, I wanted to sort of show you some sort of modelling that we've been doing at the uni here on what some of this stuff might look at. So we've got access to a pretty fancy piece of um, spatial modelling software for, for transit planning, which allows you to talk to the census data in the background with travel times and bus route configurations um, to analyse what the existing network might look like against one which actually does priority fast, frequent and, and, and direct services. So we modelled where and, and what you could get to within a 30-minute travel time uh, just looking at Melbourne's western suburbs, so what you could get to within a 30-minute travel time of uh, western Melbourne's 22 planned Melbourne major and metropolitan activity centres. So we basically analysed where you could get to from each of those particular locations within 30 minutes. And we looked at the existing network against an alternative network structure. And um, one of the parameters that we did for this was to set uh, an identical operating budget. So the, the number of operating hours of the bus services is exactly the same. So you can infer from that uh, that the actual operating cost will be more or less uh, the same. So currently now uh, we've got some fairly indirect routes. Uh, there's variable frequencies across the services. Some of them are not too bad. Uh, many, many of them are, are 40 minutes or less, but many of them uh, twist and turn around all the back streets and, and kind of don't actually travel across much terrain very, very quickly. Um, so when you look at across all those 22 activity centres, um, you've got uh, a median accessibility within 30 minutes on the public transport network during the weekdays of 41,000 people. Across an alternative network, which costs, as I say, more or less exactly the same amount to run, with fast, frequent and direct services where the bus speeds have been slightly improved through kind of what we're modelling traffic light priorities and, and bus lanes at congested points um, and a, a much simpler network, um, you can reach uh, well over three times the number of people with a, with a comparable operating cost. And so if you look at that actually at a particular location, for example, like we just, just for, for demonstration, Pacific Werribee, uh, major regional shopping centre there, what you could get to at 5pm on a weekday by public transport within 30-minute travel time, a bit over 8,000 jobs, a bit over 30,000 in people, uh, and the improvements that you can see through this network, which, again, high level, is going to cost in total uh, a similar operational budget uh, they're quite impressive uh, improvements you can make when you actually transition the network like this. So overall, essentially, the challenge of electric buses in Melbourne is really the challenge of delivering more effective suburban public transport generally. Um, electric buses, they're coming regardless. We're not going to be able to buy a diesel bus over the medium term anyway. So how can we make this transition um, effective for the use of public transport in our suburbs. It's more than just buying electric buses. It should be uh, aligned with really quite ambitious uh, network reform. And it's good to hear that, that something along those lines are being considered. And an ultimately pretty significant network reform might not need to be operationally expensive, um, but it does take political courage. And I guess that's up to all of you. Thanks very much. Uh, really interested in, in questions as well. Yeah, thanks very much, Ian. It's interesting what you say when you, you say it's more than just getting electric buses, it's about getting more people on those electric buses and in some um, really powerful figures you put up there in the last few slides. It really can show you the um, what could be done. But we, we will go to um, questions. Um, I had, a, I had lots of questions, actually, but I um, <laughs> only get to ask one. <laughs> Unfortunately, I wrote up and down, and I can't work out which one to do now. But um, we talked about the other day, um, autonomous vehicles, we, we talk about them a lot at our council, and some councillors think they're coming very shortly. Others think they're further away. And I know, Penta, you talk to you, get a different view. Can you just give us your view on when you think autonomous vehicles will be 
you know, still the mainstream and the impact that will have. Yeah, thanks, so. Look, I mean, uh, depending on where you read, there was a point up to about 2018 where everyone thought that autonomous vehicles were literally just around the corner. Um, uh, after that point, there was a tragic accident in, uh, in Western United States uh, where the autonomous vehicle clearly had, had failed, and I think everyone... Um, took a little bit of a long, hard uh, breath and realised that actually the, the, the technical challenges and the legal and ethical challenges that sit around things are, are actually really, really uh, quite complex. So my, my best guess is that, that um, they are at least a decade uh, or more away uh, from being kind of, you know, broadly publicly available in any kind of realistic form um, uh, on our roads. Um, having said that, the technology for rail uh, uh, autonomous operation is already here, has been for several decades, and is increasingly coming down the kind of s- size and complexity chain. So autonomous trams, of course, you don't need to worry about steering the tram, so the technology is a bit easier. The challenge really sits in autonomous vehicles around how do you, um, with 100% reliability, um, not hit and kill people. Um, and uh, that's, you know, it's, it's a problem we've never solved with manually driven vehicles and, and we need to get it right with the computers. And so the computers need to be better than humans. Um, and that's the challenge. So some time off. Thank you. Um, I'll hand out to Jane, who's been keeping an eye on the, the Q&A and the, on the chat there. So can you line up the next question, please, Jane? Thank you very much, Tom. Thank you, Ian. Um, and a reminder to everyone, please put your questions in the Q&A so that I can scan through and make use of them. I'm going to just read them out. I'm going to try and get a good variety. Keep your questions brief. Um, so I'm going to start with um, Yale. Thank you, Yale. What is the global state of play in alleviating practical safety concerns of um, electric um, vehicles, e.g. higher power to weight ratio leading to greater slips, trips, falls, need for acoustic warnings. This is all going to what you were just speaking about in terms of technical challenges. Um, over to you, Ian. Uh, great question, Yale. It's actually not my technical area of um, expertise, but uh, I think it's clearly a major issue that we're going to have from a road safety perspective um, when you're seeing astounding levels of power to weight ratios on some new electric vehicles. It's kind of frightening, particularly when they're kind of attached to very big and cumbersome SUVs and super utes. Um, uh, I think it's a real, a real challenge that we're going we're gonna to have um, uh, in, into the future, particularly for our road safety objectives to get to, to zero deaths. Um, thanks, Ian. Um, our next question, and Tom, a heads up to you. I don't actually have a lot of questions, so your extra questions may get a Guernsey. Um, next question is from Vincent uh, at the City of Casey. Um, he's asking, are there opportunities for local councils to engage with Melbourne Uni to work with some of the software modelling around network improvements that can form the basis of government and community advocacy efforts? Mm-hmm. Uh, great question, Vincent. Um, reach out. Let's have a chat. Um, absolutely. So I presented some material there on just the western suburbs, not just the western suburbs, the western suburbs. Um, I'm progressively um, doing some more analysis of a similar sort of type across uh, the whole of the metropolitan area, which will include Casey. If I'm working clockwise, we'll probably be nearly the last one. I would use the Mornington Peninsula. So anyway, let's reach out and talk uh, in the next couple of weeks. Um, Our next question is from um, Harry Smithers at Beach Lister. Um, He's asking, what improvements would would need to be made to the pedestrian network to enable access to the sort of direct connective network you envisage, particularly in growth areas? Um, That's a really good question. It's one that came up before, of course. Uh, Every public transport user is a pedestrian at some point uh, in their trip. So the success of your public transport network is entirely related to the safety and permeability of your urban street network in terms of how you can use that as a pedestrian. And uh, it's absolutely critical. Fortunately, some of the pedestrian realm in a lot of our many master planned outer suburban, very fringe growth areas, uh, once they're actually established, is not as bad as it is in some of our kind of more recently passed built areas. The real challenge sits around legacy designs in arterial road junctions where there's very, very poor um, um, priority and accessibility for pedestrians. And since this network is going to be disproportionately the concept network that we put forward, 
uh, Naomi talks about as well is disproportionately on the arterial road network. It's going to create quite a rethink of how we safely get people to it. And it's not only just how we safely get them to it, it's how we how the safety of access to the network is perceived by people. So even the perception of poor safety could be a major deterrent to usage mm. of the network. Uh, that's great. Thank you. Um, Annette Crohn from RMIT asks, do you have any suggestions for the renegotiation of contracts? Um, I'll put out a fairly um, um, bold position in here is I think the current form of contracts as they are are really not fit for purpose for the electric transition. Um, we'll need to totally recraft how we do them to consider uh, how... Uh, that transition is going to come uh, in a sense that the pay the pay period, the payoff period for an electric bus um, is going to be much, much longer than for, for a diesel bus. The, the vehicles will be much more longer lived, but they'll be cost more expensive. They'll be more expensive to build in the first place. The contracts need to reflect that fundamental change. I think we have also a real challenge around the fact that the majority of depots are privately owned um, and, it, you know, it's, it's a publicly subsidised bus network with, with elements of private ownership and they don't really fit well. They don't fit particularly well now, but we've kind of made do. Um, when you put a shock to the system in the electric vehicle transition, um, it really shows up how, how some of the, the um, um, sort of absurdities in how that system works, um, and particularly when you want to actually then attach it to, to a network reform ambition as well. It may well be, and this is kind of pretty bold stuff, that you might even need to, to consider sort of, you know, full kind of open book, um, you know, month by month cost operations for a period of the transition, if not something quite as absolutely bold as nationalisation of all the depots. I think that might be a step too far to consider, but it will probably solve the problem. It's a, it's a bizarre one is that you might need to nationalise the depots to actually have proper competitive tendering into the future. Um which is kind of a bit difficult to wrap your head around, but that's actually not what might be necessary. But again, it's probably a step too far. Oh, oh, great, thank you. Uh, John Liston from the City of Brimbank has asked, is there a chance that the work focusing on the Western suburbs could be shared? It'd be great to include in their advocacy material. I think they, a lot of eyeballs would have popped when they saw your um, plans there, uh, Ian. So. Yeah, um, I was actually, great question, John. I was actually astounded. I knew the theory that sits behind this fast frequent direct. I knew that it would should Im make improvements over the existing network. I was a little astounded at how much more uh, better it was. Um, uh, absolutely happy to share it. Um, something happened this morning which will assist that, which is my children started to go back to primary school, so I'll have more time to do it. So we're preparing a report at the moment which will be publicly available in the next um, month or so and happy to talk, John, about that and anyone else. Um, as I said, we're, we're gradually working our way around the rest of the city. Okay, I'm going to go to a question now from Richard and then Tom, I'm going to come to you, so get ready. Um, Richard Smithers from the City of Melbourne asks, should we an intensify development along bus routes? Um, if the bus net routes are genuinely fast, frequent and direct and they have that improved level of accessibility that, um, that, that we kind of, the modelled outputs would show, then the answer is absolutely. Um, if... Uh, it, the idea is intensively developing along bus routes which are not remotely competitive with private vehicles. The intensification, all that's going to achieve is actually greater levels of congestion as more people try to get to those intensive developments by car. So um, if you do it along the concepts, whether it's exactly as I've modelled, is really not quite to the point. But if you're doing something that's like that, that shows vastly improved levels of accessibility, absolutely you should do that. And in fact... It's a much more efficient way to do it because you could roll out a network of that sort of scale in five, six, seven years, not 10, 20, 30 years that, that we're currently considering for some of our big um, public transport investments. That's great. Thank you. Uh, Tom, your next question. Hey, my next question is Sydney's on a similar, um, well, they talk similarly about electrifying their buses, and I know their bus mm -hmm. networks, Tully. And we've looked at some overseas cities where they've done very good, well, their, their trans, public transport system is based on buses, and that's been successful. Can you give us a context of cities similar to Melbourne that have achieved more out of their buses than we have when you look at the, 
the number of people catching buses, how much we spend, and given that two thirds of Melbourne is dependent on buses, you know, are there cities that have done better in similar situations to Melbourne? Yeah. So my my um, um, master of philosophy, so the short form PhD research, was really looking at how um, buses interacted with the metro network in Montreal. And they operated on a, a system of um, basically having uh, frequent buses uh, running in parallel to, to the network, uh, the, the metro network's um, service frequencies right up until midnight. So basically, if you got on a bus, if you got on a metro, you'd know you would be able to get on a bus home. So effectively, it dramatically expanded the reach of that metro's network because basically the people who were on the metro uh, could be from well beyond the walking distance of the stations of the metro themselves. They could be sort of right out into far-flung suburbs, but basically because the, the buses were actually still, um, you know, they would be reliably there pretty soon after you got uh, off the metro station at even quite one of the far-flung um, metro stations, and that would then, the bus would take you right out to to the outlying areas. Um, you know, the urban fabric of somewhere like Montreal is not dramatically different um, uh, from, from much of Melbourne. Um, Toronto is another example of it as well, uh, where certainly through the city of Toronto, they've been able to achieve um, incredible things with, with a bus network. Now, they would, you know, both those two cities would absolutely love to have a rail network or a tram network of our scale, um, but they recognise, well, uh, they don't. It's going to cost too much for them to put it in. Um, uh, so they'll do whatever they can with buses. We're in an incredibly great starting position to do this, is that all we have to do is put the buses in. Um, and, and, you know, if you... It's much easier to put in a much better bus network than it is to try and uh, replicate the tram or rail network that we've already got. Um, so uh, there are international examples of doing it. Um, I think the thing that's really important is we can do that here. It's not going to cost us uh, a dramatic amount more in terms of operations if we actually get our signal engineers and a few people with some red paint. Uh, I'm not underestimating the political challenges at a very local, a very fine at you know, really granular local level doing some of these things, but we can do it. It's affordable. Okay, well, it's 11 19 on the dot now, Jane. Is there one more burning question that's been um, put in there? I'm going to raise this one um, from an anonymous attendee, but I think you've also begun to touch on it, Ian. So um, um, they ask what considerations do state and local governments need to take into account when communicating and implementing the fast, frequent, direct concept to bus users and the community? Yeah, uh, really great question. I'm not an advertising person, but I would say that someone with a great advertising visual brain could take the kind of numbers that I'm presenting of improved accessibility there and spin that into these are the types of jobs you can reach now without owning that second, third, fourth car. And um, absolutely it's part of it and should be part of it. And it'll be really exciting to sit back and watch that advertisement because it would get me really excited. <laughs> well, thank, thank you. Sorry we have to finish it off there. And I was really enjoying your uh, insights and Stop. knowledge of all these things. <laughs> it's been the whole day doing that. But um, we, we have scheduled in a break for 10 minutes so during that period in five minutes' time, there'll be some videos from the Mayor of Bendigo and the Mayor of Mildura, which um, talk about, and they'll be on 